When Moses had finished all the work, the cloud covered the meeting tent, and the Lord's glorious presence filled the dwelling. Moses couldn't enter the meeting tent because the cloud had settled on it, and the Lord's glorious presence filled the dwelling. Whenever the cloud rose from the dwelling, the Israelites would set out on their journeys. But if the cloud didn't rise, then they didn't set out until the day it rose. The Lord's cloud stayed on the dwelling during the day with lightning in it at night, clearly visible to the whole household of Israel at every stage of their journey. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you. It's good to see you in worship, to see so many modern worship t-shirts. It's super awesome. So good. Friends, we have been on a journey these last four weeks. And because I keep up with statistics, I know that most people who come to church who consider themselves active attenders 1.4 times a month. So let me catch you up on where we've been, just in the off chance. Maybe you missed a Sunday or two. All right. The very first Sunday, we talked about this miraculous deliverance of the baby Moses and how he was pulled out of the reeds by women who were from two cultures who were at war with each other, but decided to put those conflicts down in order to save an innocent life. And then the next week, we talked about Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush in the desert in Sinai. And then the week after that, we talked about the ten plagues and how those are actually really quite complicated if we take the Bible literally and not seriously. Christopher Vaughn gave us a good word about that. And then last week, we got to the moment of deliverance and the parting of the Reed Sea. And here we are. The scripture that you just heard is the very last piece of the book of Exodus. Like I felt like I should have said, the end, right? That is where the story ends, and it works perfectly with our liturgical calendar. Now, the moment I say liturgical calendar today, some of you just go powering down, all right? But let me tell you why liturgical calendar is an awesome thing. We have this way of organizing time in the church that is, in some sense, really a spiritual discipline. Every year, we follow the major events of Jesus' life. And on some of the really big ones, we have these things we call feast days. So, for example, Easter is a feast day. The day of Christmas is a feast day. Pentecost is a feast day. And guess what? Today is a feast day in the liturgical calendar, and I'm super stoked about it. And I know you would probably have no idea what I'm talking about which is totally fine. But there's prizes involved. So if you can tell me what today's feast day is, please raise your hand. Today is the feast day of the... Oh, I got one. You got it? The feast day of the chili cook-off. No, that's next week. (laughs) That's awesome. No, the great principal feast day of the chili cook-off is actually one week from today. All right, uh, let me give you a clue or two. It involves a mountain. Anybody? What's that? Raise your hand again. Sorry. Yeah? Okay, I'll give you another one. It involves Moses. Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is very close. That did involve Moses in a mountain, but not a feast day. But we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So you're on the right track. It also involves Elijah. Raise your hand if you know this. Okay, let me give you the children's moment answer. It also involves Jesus. You can say with me. Ready? Jesus. Moses, Jesus, and Elijah on a mountain. Anybody at all? Hey, there it is. Ladies and gentlemen, Janelle Taylor is walking away with Thin Mints. All right on. Very good. Give it up for Janelle. All right. Now, it's okay that you don't know this because the, 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 the feast day of the Transfiguration, I think, is like the most under-celebrated, under-talked about moment in the liturgical calendar. And why it's a feast day is because it illustrates for us the principle of transfiguration. So just in the off chance you haven't heard the story, it sounds like this. This comes from the gospel according to St. Mark, which is the gospel we will be reading through for Lent, which starts this week. Six days after Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. And he, Jesus, was transfigured in front of them. And his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. And Peter reacted to all this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Tough but fair. And then a cloud overshadowed them. Perhaps it was something like the cloud that was in the tent of the meeting. And it said, this is my son who I dearly love. Listen to him. And suddenly... 
Looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except for Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This story illustrates for us this principle of transfiguration. And it's a principle that actually we experience in our daily lives all the time, but sometimes we're so busy, we miss it. For example, how many of you have seen the beautiful daffodils in the church garden? Uh, They're lovely, right? The daffodils are a sign for us that God is coming to transfigure the death that we experience in winter into new life in spring. And if you see Cindy Rail this morning, she is the one who planted them. Thank you, Cindy. We see it in other ways, too, in ways in which humans involve their craftsmanship. For example, y'all might not know this, but I like the guitar a little bit. This is a guitar. You should never run into a house if it's on fire. But if I'd gotten all the kids, I'd come back for this. All right? This, for example, is a great illustration of the transfiguration. This is a Taylor 514 CE. And it's made with wood that was from a dead tree, an African mahogany tree in West Africa on the back and the sides. And the front is from a dead western cedar in the western part of the United States. And this little piece around here is a koa tree from Hawaii. And this piece right here is a a tropical mahogany neck. And the part right through here is ebony from a dead ebony tree. So when humans find these things, they put together all these different elements with a little bit of string and transfigure dead pieces of wood into things that make glorious music. Or another example of transfiguration are those two trees that you see there. Those two trees were pulled, they were architectural trees, part of an urban uh, arborist work. There was an apartment complex by Six Flags that was getting bulldozed, and so the trees were taken out. And then a good friend of mine, an amazing artist, fashioned this pulpit out of those trees. And they're to match this cross, which he also made for us, which the copper is from the 10th anniversary of this church. Someday come up and look at it. You can see all the different pieces that folks uh, nailed into the copper about their dreams. And the cross really is perhaps the most incredible example of transfiguration we have in our faith. God took something, a symbol of execution, of death, of oppression, and transfigured it into something that is beautiful that moves towards new life and new hope. And I think that's kind of what was happening for Jesus on the mountain when he was with Moses and Elijah. Because you see, from the mountain, Jesus descends into Jerusalem for what I think he in his heart of hearts suspected might be his very last trip there. Because Jesus was preaching a message against the totalist system. And when you go against the totalist system like that, the system doesn't like it. And Jesus, I suspect, knew that there was a good chance he was not going to come out of Jerusalem alive. And the human part of him was probably terrified about that. And yet he meets Moses, this incredible figure of liberation, and Elijah, who speaks of God's better world. And I suspect that what was happening is that they were saying, it's going to be rough, but God is with you. God was with us, and God will never let you go. And regardless of what happens to you, God will use God's power to transfigure it. And the church has wisely put the Feast of the Transfiguration the Sunday before Lent in our calendar because we, too, have the opportunity to take a deeper spiritual journey this Lent. And when we think about journeying, sometimes we think about being in the wilderness or we think of being on the sea. And when we get out into those places in life, We learn often that we can trust God, that God is with us, that there is nothing that is beyond the grasp and the reach of God, and that there is nothing so difficult or so painful or so ugly that God can't, in some way that only God does, transfigure it into something beautiful. It's like we sang earlier that God is the one in the wilderness. God is the wandering in the wild. And part of our journey as spiritual people, as followers of Jesus, is to train our eyes and our vision so that we can see God at work in our everyday lives. You know, a lot has happened to our friends, the Israelites, since we last left them, parting the Red Sea to the end of the book. And if I didn't catch you up on that really quickly, I would be doing you a giant disservice. All right? So from the time the Israelites were liberated from their oppression and the totalist system in Egypt to the time when they get to the promised land, it took them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And the number 40, as you find it all throughout Scripture, Noah was on the ark for how long? 
40 days. That's right. Moses lived in Egypt as a, as a child to a young man for 40 years. I'm going with a young man for 40. He's a 41-year-old. And then he went out into, thank you, went out into the desert for 40, 40 years. He was a shepherd, 40 years in the desert. And then he helps to liberate the, Egypt, the Israelites from the Egyptians. And in that time, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus, as we'll read next week, gets sent out into the wilderness for 40 days. And today we are reading out of the 40th chapter of the Exodus. I have no idea what that means, other than it seems to be very important. So I'll leave it to you to find out. But during this long season of wandering, important and difficult things happen to the Israelites and to God. And what happens is they get across the Reed Sea, and they're moving towards Mount Sinai. And this was the sign that God told Moses from the burning bush, that you will come back and worship me on this mountain. And you know what? It happened. It took them 11 hard months to go from the Reed Sea to get and arrive at Mount Sinai. And during those 11 months, it didn't always go great. And that's an important lesson for us, I think, from the Exodus, is that our spiritual lives, our walk with God, our regular everyday lives, they don't always go great. There's trouble. Things become hard, and yet God is with them. They were in a desert, and God provides them water. They were hungry, and God gives them manna and quail, but only for each day. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, like we're going to do in just a little bit, we pray that God to give us the bread we need for this day. Just like the Israelites, we have to learn to trust that God is going to provide for us. But eventually, over this 11-month journey, they get to Mount Sinai. And what's kind of fun about this is they have this almost period of courtship between God and the Israelites. All right? They have yet to make their covenant together. It's almost like God needed to see what kind of people these Israelites really were. And the Israelites needed to see what kind of God this liberating God actually was before they joined themselves together. But they decide that they will. They make a covenant. Moses goes up, or they're about to make a covenant. Moses goes up to the mountain. He's talking with God, receives the Ten Commandments. But while he's gone, the Israelites get impatient and they create this golden calf and they decide to worship it. And Moses is walking down the mountain and sees it and breaks the original Ten Commandments. And God is like losing God's mind. God is like, seriously, I sent millions of frogs for you people. I split the waters for you people, and you can't give us like three days to work something out. Like, God's done with it. God's like, I'm done with you people. God even calls the Israelites a stiff necked people, which I imagine carried a lot more oomph back in the day. But Moses reminds God, works with God, tells God that your promise, God, was that these people would be a blessing for the world. So what does it mean if they get this far and then you abandon them? Moses changes God's mind. Moses keeps them together, and then they, they reunite, and they decide to go ahead and make this covenant. And they make this thing uh, called, we call the tent of meeting, but in the Hebrew it translates to the tent of rendezvous. So with those who have ears to hear, may you hear it. All right? So they're building this thing in this 11 months called the Tent of Meeting. And it's a place where they can go together to make sacrifices to God, to worship God together, to look for the leading, God and the, uh, the leading of God in their life. And this is really important because in the book of Exodus, there are more chapters devoted to the building of the Tent of Meeting than there are to the, all of the plagues and the liberation from Egypt combined. This is important. This is how God and the Israelites are going to meet one another in the wilderness. And this is where the scripture comes at the end of the Exodus as they're preparing to journey out into the wilderness. That God's presence in this cloud inhabits the tent of meeting and after they finish it they're free to head out with God as their guide and they do they look to God to guide them out of not only the actual totalist system that was oppressing them but the totalist system that had gotten inside of their heart from all that time from slavery and they flourish in the wilderness they move with God as God moves until they come to a place called Kardesh Barea where they settle for 38 years See, wilderness doesn't necessarily mean you're always on the move. Wilderness can be in all kinds of different places in our lives. Can you imagine being in one place for 38 years, knowing that the promised land was promised to you, but you haven't seen it yet? I'm guessing many of you know exactly what that's like. 
And so it would be attempting to understand when folks would ask the question, am I doomed to live in the wilderness forever? And friends, the answer is no. There is a promised land. You are going to get there, but the journey is what makes the thing. Our lives, like the lives of the Israelites, are a long spiritual journey. It's a journey that takes our whole life to get to where we need to go. This idea of journeying with God, of finding flourishing with God in the wilderness is a part of every major Christian spiritual tradition. Take, for example, the ancient Celts. These were amazing people. They had a practice called peregrinatio. All right, you want to try with me? It's delightful to say. Peregrinatio. Yeah, I like Italian slash Latin thing. You did great there. Very nice. Peregrinatio is a word for a journey, but not just any kind of journey, not even a pilgrimage, but a journey that starts without an understanding of the destination. There isn't a fixed destination in this spiritual and physical practice of peregrinatio. One who is involved in peregrinatio doesn't know when the journey will end or how long it will take to get there, and they don't even know what it looks like when they arrived. And the ancient Celts, some of them took this so seriously, they built these little boats called coracles. And they would get in these coracles, and the coracles didn't have sails or a rudder. And they would get out onto the sea and let the very breath of the wind from God and the waves move them to wherever they felt God was calling them to go. And if that isn't a metaphor for the spiritual life, I don't know what is. Esther DeWall talked about the, the characteristics of those who would go on something like a peregrinatio, saying this, that they were ready to go wherever the spirit might take them, seeing themselves, I love this, as hospitus mundi, as guests of the world. St. Francis was into stuff like that. Jesus was into stuff like that. What they were actually seeking is the place of resurrection, of their resurrected self, of the true self in Christ, which is for all of us our true home. A life of flourishing in the wilderness with God is about trusting God and following God. And on the journey, Roger Owen says, the journey to our truest homes is our hidden lives with Christ and God. And friends, that journey can take place if you get on a plane and you travel the globe, but it can also take place if you never even leave the county of your birth. Our spiritual journeys, our flourishing with God in the wilderness takes place right where we are. You don't have to get on a plane and go to the Holy Land to do it. If you can, though, trust me, you should do that. But it takes place right now. Our peregrinatio, our journey to our home with the resurrected self in Christ, is happening right now. As Jose Pascal would say, we are embarked. By the mere factor of your presence here or watching the sermon online, you are doing it. But friends, our peregrinatio does not take place primarily in the church, but rather it takes place mostly out in the world. Our flourishing with God takes place in those everyday moments of our life. It takes place when you are stuck in traffic. Or as I heard a guy say this week, he considers traffic more like a parade in which he gets to be a part of. <laughs> he says it makes coming home from work a little less defeating. So I turn on some music and like, isn't it great to be in the traffic parade today? That's where our peregrinatio takes place. It takes place when we're making food for a child or a spouse early in the morning, getting ready to send them out on their day. It takes place when we're walking towards that meeting, when we're going down that long hallway for the thing that you know is probably not going to go well. This is where our peregrinatio takes place. Our journey is happening right now. And what I want to say to you today is, I think if we know how to look, we can see how each of these moments is deeply infused and imbued with the presence of God. The one who made us, the one who goes with us on our journey, and the one in whom ultimately we find our truest home. Friends, it's out there if we just learn how to look. And the tools to help us develop our vision are right here. They're available to us. Just like for the Israelites in the wilderness, the cloud of presence was God's presence, yes, but also an indication for them of where to see God at work in the world. Just like the Celts who trusted that God would be with them so much, they began to see God in everything. They hopped on those coracles and went into the sea. That was a tool for them. And friends, there are tools available for you and I, and this Lent is the time to pick some of them up. 
As we prepare to enter into this season, it's a great opportunity for us to go deeper in our spiritual lives and as a community. As I mentioned, it starts this Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. We've got a service at 12 and a service at 7. Come to one of them. Have your fun on Fat Tuesday, but then let's do this together, all right? And friends, Lent is an important season because it's often so very misunderstood. Lent, in its original idea, was not a time for deep sacrifice. It wasn't a time to give up dark chocolate or red wine or work to improve your waistline. It's designed to be a season for preparation, but the church kind of messed themselves up because for hundreds of years, the church, and even still in some places today, got really good at infusing guilt into what should be a season of growth and preparation because you see Lent in its original form was designed to be a time of preparation for people who are going to be baptized on Easter. It's not about giving something up. It isn't about time to give up your your red wine or what have you, whatever the thing is for you. It's a time to go deeper and deeper into our spiritual practices. So if you insist on giving something up for Lent in honor of Christ's sacrifice, that's a glorious thing. But what I want to encourage you to do is to take that time that you would normally do with the thing you were giving up and use that time for a new spiritual practice. This is how we grow deeper. From spiritual discipline, spiritual practices are designed for liberation. They're designed to help us connect with God, to go deeper with God, to stay in love with God, like John Wesley said that we talked about this past week. This is how we do it. And Wesleyan spirituality, there is such a thing, calls these practices, these tools, the means of grace. And just like last week, we talked about how personal holiness and social holiness are things that must be held together. We also have tools in how to do that. We call them works of piety and works of mercy. So let's take a quick look at each. And I encourage you to take out your phone, take a picture. Maybe we'll throw it up online. We'll see. But works of piety is how we do personal holiness. And they're broken into individual pieces and communal pieces. Individually, we can do things like spiritual reading, meditating and studying the scriptures, prayer, fasting, regularly coming to worship. Regularly means more than 1.4 times a month. Healthy living and sharing our faith with others. Communally, we share regularly in the sacraments. So you could combine those two and bring a friend with you next Sunday when we're going to be in, ex- exploring the sacrament of Holy Communion together and experiencing it. Christian conferencing, which is a fancy way of saying, get in a small group. We're going to try to help you find these. And then also studying the Bible together. Works of piety is how we do personal holiness. Now, social holiness, we do that through works of mercy, which is also broken down to individual and communal practices. Let's go to the next one if we could. Thank you. Works of mercy, individual things, we're called to do good works. We're called to visit the sick, to feed those in prison, excuse me, to visit those in prison, to feed the hungry, and to give generously to the needs of others. You do not need to be an ordained person to do this. And Protestantism, we believe this thing, the priesthood of all believers, God has already invited you into this work. And communally, we're called to seek justice. We're called to end oppression and discrimination. When Wesley was alive, he worked very diligently with his followers in England and in the United States to abolish slavery. They got it done quicker in England than we did here. And we are called to work to address the needs of the poor. Now, this right here is not something I just made up. This is straight off of our United Methodist Church website. This is how we do these things together. So what if, what if instead of giving up your favorite dark chocolate or Malbec or Pinot Noir, what if you took on one discipline from each category, from the works of piety or the works of mercy category, and tried them out for six weeks? I wonder how these next six weeks of Lent might be dramatically different for you. How your spiritual life would change and deepen and grow. And how might you see God in new ways? I bet if you took even just one or two of these, your peregrinatio, friends, your journey would become richer and fuller. And let me suggest to you one other practice that isn't on our official Methodist Lent, but it's the practice that the Celts gave us of being a people of blessing. This way of blessing was passed down all the way. You can see it now in current Scottish Christianity. The Celts had this incredible practice of being a people of blessing. And this 
way of blessing the world help them see God in their own lives and also to see the image of God in their friends and in their neighbors. And the practice allowed them to partner with God to bless the world. And friends, that's what God said the descendants of Abraham and Sarah were going to do. They were going to bless the world. This is, what, um, this is the reason why the Israelites were liberated from the Egyptians, to bless the world. That's what Jesus and his disciples, which involves you and me, are supposed to do, to be a people of blessing who can bless the world. And what I loved about the way the Celts did it is they did it in the small things in their lives and in the big things. They would, they would take a hammer they were about to use and say, bless to me the use of this hammer. Bless to me this dog I've got to walk. Bless to me this terrible copier that makes my life so difficult. That last one is maybe not in there originally. All right? But this idea of training ourselves to see God at work in the world it's a way in which we can look and see and begin to see maybe for the first time or to grow deeper if you're seeing it already that the universal Christ is imbued in everything. What if we were to become a people who were known for our blessing? How would our world, how would our businesses, how would our schools, how would our neighborhoods, how would our lives look different if we could see the universal Christ in them and if we could see the Christ was in us. If we were able to do that, the ordinary, everyday things in our life would become our coracles. We would see that God is imbued in all of it. And I suspect that practicing the means of grace and the ability to live lives in this blessed way would make all of the difference in the world. Friends, our life is a journey. It's a paragonatio, a coming out from God and a returning to God, the God who made the universe. And it's a way of seeing God is in all things. And so because McDonald's has reissued the shamrock shake, we may be a few weeks early, but I think it ties all the things together to pray together the most famous part of the prayer that was found on St. Patrick's breastplate. Would you pray with me this prayer that we may see Christ who is all around us? Let us pray together. Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ to the right of me, Christ to the left of me, Christ in my lying, my sitting, my rising. Christ in the heart of all who know me. Christ on the tongue of all who meet me. Christ in the eye of all who see me. And Christ in the ear of all who hear me. Beloved children of God, the universal Christ imbues all that is, all that you will encounter and in the days to come. And the universal Christ is in you. May we train ourselves to have the awareness and the vision to see it. In the name of our creator, liberator, and sustainer, let all of God's people say, amen. amen.